However, it is time for member statement, and I recognize the member from Niagara Falls. You're early. You're early. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, apologize for, uh, for that, but I had to get my glasses. I rise today to tell the Premier that he must deal with COVID, COVID waste times in Niagara. We have outbreaks in nine schools. We have worried parents, teachers, grandparents, and kids. In Niagara, families can't get COVID tests for days, and when they can, they are forced to wait hours before getting tested. One family with a six-year-old called for a test on Tuesday and didn't hear back until Friday. On the day that the child did the test, they waited four hours, and they needed to leave repeatedly to make a washroom break. Imagine that experience for a six-year-old. These are kids who don't understand COVID or testing and are scared. They miss school and they wait in their car the entire day for a test that may or may not happen. Stories like this occur before the closure of our drive through testing facility, which often had lineups at 6 a.m. despite opening at 9. When COVID cases start rising, we have very little time to get the virus under control. We know that in a week, cases can spiral out of control and begin to overwhelm our hospitals. Frontline workers are trying their hardest, but they just can't keep up. We can address these issues head on. We must have easier and quicker access to testing in Niagara. To the Premier, I say this. Look at what's happening testing in Niagara and get the needed resources there immediately. With the proper resources in place, this process can be quick and easier for our children and their families. Parents will need less time off work and, above all, will give the people the information they need to keep our community safe. Mr. Speaker, people without sick days to cover missed days from work and kids missing school can't wait a week for testing. It's not reasonable. It's not safe. The Conservative government must support our frontline workers, release funding, support. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> member statements. The member for Mississauga Mall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, traditionally inhabited by Indigenous people. As settler, I am grateful for the opportunity to meet here, and we'd like to say thank you. Thank you for all the generation of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge Orange Shirt Day, recognized on September 30th, the day inspired by Phyllis Jack Webster, who in 1973, at the age of six, attended her, her first day of school in Williams Lake, BC, wearing a brand new orange shirt gifted by her grandmother. When she arrived at the school, Phyllis new orange shirt was stripped and taken away from her, something she never wore again. Phyllis has courageously spoken about the devastating impact this action had on her dignity and self-worth, and how it made her feel as if her existence did not matter. Today, Mr. Speaker, I'm wearing an orange shirt to become the part of reconciliation journey, acknowledging the painful truth of the long-lasting multi-generational impact of the residential school system on the indigenous communities. As we move forward together on the path of reconciliation, I urge all Ontarians to honor survivors like Phyllis and their families who have bravely shared their experiences and to commit to learning more about the legacy of the residential school system in Canada. We need to acknowledge, Mr. Speaker, every child matters. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. My constituent, Mrs. Covington, is the mother of two young children, Paige and Ethan. Both of her children have special needs and have individual education plans with their schools in, my, uh, in Hanmer in my riding. Since August, Mrs. Kevington has been trying to get answers from administrators, from principals, from health professionals about how to keep her children's individual education plan with online learning. Unfortunately, all she's getting is frustrated and confused. Speaker, Mrs. Kevington is a good mother who wants her children to succeed, and she is deaf. The challenges that she faces on a daily basis are unbelievable. Her son is not motivated to learn online. Many online tools do not have closed captioning, leaving her and her son to try to sign to each other words that he has not even learned yet. Keeping her son with ADHD engaged in onla online learning is causing a lot of family friction. It is demoralizing, Speaker. 
Her daughter, Paige, is slowly losing her hearing. A teacher wearing a mask gave her online classes. That did not work. She could not read lips and words were all muffled. Therefore, she moved to in-class learning, but yet the amplification system that she needs is not available. So most days, she leaves school with a stress headache. Speaker, our public education system is the great equalizer. Our schools need the resources during the pandemic and always to meet the educational needs of those two children and all children with special needs. Great. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Member statements, the member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. On September 18th, I had the pleasure of joining the Minister of Infrastructure, who's also the member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, and Brock, along with the member for Whitby and the member for Pickering Uxbridge in Oshawa to announce more than $126 million in joint federal, provincial, and regional funding for 11 public transit projects that will modernize and improve public transit and active transportation in Durham Region. Here's where some of that funding is going, Speaker. Implementation of a 10-kilometer north-south bus rapid transit corridor through Oshawa that will run along Simcoe Street from Royal Street north to Highway 407. The project will include eight new conventional buses, new bus shelters, and traffic signal upgrades that will improve service reliability along the transit corridor. Construction of bus rapid transit lanes with active transportation corridors are also happening on Kingston Road in Ajax, Dundas Street in Whitby, and downtown Oshawa, including new cycling lanes and multi-use paths to connect to transit stations. Improvement to bus stop infrastructure safety and accessibility across the region is also happening, including adding more lighting, which matters for those most vulnerable in our community when they're standing there waiting for their bus. The replacement of older vehicles with 11 conventional buses, with new hybrid electric vehicles, 13 conventional buses and 16 minibuses, as well as the purchase of two additional articulated buses for the bus rapid transit fleet. Together, these investments will provide for residents with more frequent, accessible and reliable bus service. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Next, we have the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Last weekend, our office held a virtual town hall on social assistance, and it was a disturbing event. I'm going to ask all my fellow colleagues here listening to this to just be wary that I'm about to talk about some challenging things, and if anybody's watching this at home with small children, I invite you to ask them to tune out. With that warning, Speaker, what we heard from far too many people who participated in our town hall was that people with disabilities are living in some, such abject conditions that many have applied for medical assistance in dying. Christina Ranieri, Executive Director of Ability First Ottawa, a many decorated person who works with over 300 clients, informed us that over 100 of people she works with have made this application. I'm raising this today to ring an alarm bell with my colleagues in this House because folks have been living alone, socially isolated, many without access to the appropriate medications, many living in constant pain. I invite us to think about what it's like to live without powered equipment that's necessary to live our lives, whether it be a chair or oxygen tanks. I imagine all of us to ask what it's like to have a $100 a month benefit now out of their monthly income when they were living already deeply below poverty. Speaker, the member for Windsor West and I have a meeting later today with an advocacy organization on this issue. I invite the government to immediately reinstate that $100 a month and help folks who are absolutely struggling. We have to do it as a province. Member statements. The member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Speaker, this past Saturday, I joined with MP Scott Reed and Mayor Fennick, the, the mayor of uh, the town of Perth, along with hundreds of our other residents and visitors to pay tribute to many of the veterans from Perth with the inaugural unveiling of the Pathway of Heroes. 101 banners commemorating our veterans are now being displayed, hung on the street lamps of downtown Perth. The following is the address that I delivered to that large assembly of people. I'll be brief, because the actions of those we celebrate today speak much louder than any words that I could possibly deliver. 
Today, we honour those who volunteered to take a stand against tyranny and defended our principles of freedom, justice and democracy. Those we remember today held a strong belief that even with our differences, we have much more in common and that the society we built together is better than any alternative and worth defending. Courage is not the absence of fear. It is doing what you know is right despite your fears. We honour their courage today, lest we forget. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> Speaker, Perth Wellington is home to so many accomplished young people. Julie Nottebomber is one of them. She is an open water swimmer. Julia recently became the youngest person ever to swim across Lake Erie. This is a remarkable achievement. She spent months preparing for this 20-kilometer swim. Her training included swimming five times a week in open water and practicing in her parents' unheated pool in the colder months. Julia successfully completed her swim on August 30th, her 14th birthday. Julia's athletic accomplishments are just part of the story. Speaker, she used this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for something more. Julia wanted to, this event to double as a fundraiser for the Make-A-Wish Foundation, which works to fulfill the wishes of critically ill children. Speaker, Julia raised over $27,000. Julia, congratulations on your achievements, and thank you for inspiring all of us, young and old, to use our talents to benefit others. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. The member for Kiewetnog. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Orange Shirt Day. We observe this day to raise awareness of the impacts of Indian residential schools in our communities. We acknowledge the survivors and the ones that did not survive. Phyllis Webstad, an elder now in uh, Williams Lake, BC, inspired Orange Shirt Day. She was six years old on her first day of residential school in 1973. Before she left home, uh, her grandmother dressed her in an orange shirt. She said, and I quote, when I got to school, they took my clothes, including the orange shirt. I never saw it again. She continued, the color orange has always reminded me of the day how no one cared and how I felt I was nothing, worth nothing. All of us little children were crying and no one cared." End quote. Indian residential schools were a creation of government colonial policies using the churches. They took away our way of life, our language, from generations of our children. They neglected us. They sexually abused us. They murdered us. Through these schools, Canada attempted to commit genocide against Indigenous peoples. This genocide exists in the complacency of governments today. Our people pay in full, Mr. Speaker, for this inaction with their health and with their, with their lives. Governments can and must do better. But today, I'm grateful for those who survived and who thrived, and I'm thankful for the ongoing strength and resilience of our people. Mr. Miigwech. Thank you. Member's statements, the member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. As you know, I represent the great riding of Mississauga East Cooksville, where I have lived for almost 20 years. My riding is the place where my kids were born and are growing up, and where my parents are living out their golden years. The community where I live has been performing excep exceptionally in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis. Throughout the last six months, I have witnessed tremendous kindness and generosity from individuals, families, businesses, and community groups. People came together to collect donations of money, food, and PPE for those who needed it most. They took the time to stay home, 
isolate and socially distance to combat the rise in cases earlier this year and did their best to get us all through the first wave and into phase three of our recovery. I want to thank the residents of Mississauga East Cooksville community and all the communities across Ontario for doing their part to stop the spread of COVID-19. Please don't forget to download, install, and activate the COVID Alert app on your phone. Wear your mask, keep your distance, wash your hands, and get your flu shot. Ontarians have shown remarkable resilience and commitment to supporting each other this year. I know we can continue to show one another just how much we can accomplish when we work together. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Markham Unionville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. World Vision is a global relief, development, and advocacy organization that aims to support and empower kids, families, and communities to rise out of poverty and tackle injustice. Today, World Vision, with the support of volunteers, are helping more than 4 million children in nearly 100 countries. I'm proud to say that I have been a volunteer for World Vision for over three decades and currently sponsoring six kids. This organization has a special place in my heart. Mr. Speaker, six kilometers is the average distance a woman or a child in the developing world will walk for water. And too often, the water obtained is not clean to drink and may cause illness, even death. This year, 2020, Global 6K aims to fund clean water projects in the Mankau region of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank everyone who attend and participate in World Vision's Markham Unionville Walk for Clean Water fundraising event. Following the health protocols and in combination with four teams, Billy Pang at Friends, Grace Chinese Gospel Church of North York, MC Mo Thai Academy and Conditioning, and Wesley Marie and Winnie Zumba Dance, we fundraised over 10,000 to support clean water projects for kids last Saturday. Let's continue to change lives one day, uh, one day at a time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well said, well said. That concludes our member statements for this morning.